Hello, Pastor R. Hello, everybody. We are, uh, we, we've got a good topic for you today. I think it's something that a lot of people are interested in. I think it's something that a lot of people um, think about all the time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're consumed by this yes. for many different reasons. I think it, uh, it affects our health and our well-being. It even affects our relationships and it affects our relationship with ourselves i believe so so that topic is actually the topic of weight loss and uh, we want to start out by looking into the word and and seeing what our uh good book the bible has to say about some of that and then we'll dig deep and hopefully give you a lot of practical things you can start putting into the into uh, practice immediately to help you achieve your goals yes well i'm sure that somewhere along the line you've heard about daniel's diet of course and the question is Let's hear the story and how did Daniel come to the conviction of his diet? Yes. It reads in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, that Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. Mm. So Daniel was part of an indoctrination program. He and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had been taken from their home in Jerusalem yes. over to Babylon. Now they were to serve the king. So they were teaching them the Babylonian language and the Babylonian culture. And the subjects and gave him brand new names. Wow. And the king, because of his generosity and greatness, decided to give the boys their diet, what they should eat. Right. The only problem with the Babylonian diet was it had things forbidden for Daniel to eat, things that had been sacrificed to idols, mm. to the Babylonian gods. Yes. And they weren't prepared according to the Jew Jewish dietary restrictions. So you know, probably on the diet consisted of things like Babylonian pork au brochette, <laughs> or Babylonian lobster thermidor, <laughs> or Babylonian oysters Rockefeller. Yeah. All these forbidden foods that Daniel yeah. would eat. Not only that, but there's also wine that was being offered to the idols. So Daniel made a decision. He resolved something in his heart. He, it was really a test of his faith because he realized that to partake of these foods would be a defilement to him. Mm. Um, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. So in his diet, he made a choice yeah. to, to not eat the king's food and to ask for another kind of food. Right. And it says later in, that Daniel said to the chief guard who appointed him over Daniel, please test your servants for 10 days Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. So I'm not sure exactly, Dr. Muir, like what <laughs> vegetables he was given to eat, but you know, yes. we were in the summertime. So I can imagine things like zucchini squash yeah. and tomatoes and right. onions and these vegetables that would have been part of his diet. So right. restricting his diet from the king's food, his king's you know, elaborate um, banquet to now simple vegetables to eat and water to drink. And he said, compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants with accordance with what you see. So the king's eunuch agreed for 10 days to test Daniel with this diet. Um, it really was for Daniel a test of his faith, his yeah. courage to make a decision like this because the royal official was worried that if he became skinnier, the king would have his head. And Daniel said, well, just, I think he saw the sincerity of Daniel yeah. and his faith. And he said, okay. So at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. For 10 days, he only ate vegetables and water. He was healthier than the other young men. You don't think he had sneakers bars in his room? <laughs> <laughs> he, he may well have cheated on the day on the day of that. <laughs> As we'll say in, in our subsequent conversation, you know, eating a Snickers bar probably is not that big a deal to have one. Yeah. But to have a lifetime of Snickers bars maybe is a different deal. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's one of the principles of um, getting healthy is called the compound effect of, yes. of how small choices Yes. Small little things you do, if you continue to do them long term, is when you see the big, amazing, incredible results. Yes. Things like eating white sugar and white flour mm -hmm. and white rice. And so these, these things that we would eat 
sort of like without thinking, if we choose not to over a long yes. period of time, we see the great beneficial effects. Absolutely, absolutely. And if and if someone's having a hard time with those things, it can be even a smaller change than that. It can be just hey, I'm I'm gonna eat half the candy I usually eat. Yes, and watch the changes that take place. But you know, part of it is we have to understand that you're not going to see an instant result. Mm. We're not going to because I promise you this: <laughs> if if let's let's say I put a, an unhealthy food in front of you, let's say a a, a cheesecake, you know, mm. and, and I apologize for those of us who think cheesecakes are healthy, <laughs> but let's say it has has some carbs and protein, has some fat, you know. Anyways, uh, we put a cheesecake in front of you. If imagine if the minute I was done eating that cheesecake, I would balloon out to 250, 290 pounds. I would immediately look 30 years older than my age. Do you think it'd be easier for me not to eat that cheesecake sure. next time? Sure. But what happens <laughs> is I'll eat the whole cheesecake and I'll still look the same still pretty much feel the same I enjoyed it the next day I'm not too much different so then I'll eat another one and another one and then eventually the compound effect of it is I'll end up looking and feeling the way I don't want to feel and look and I found this to be true Dr. Amir that the less cheesecake I have around my house the less cheesecake I eat <laughs> yeah and the more cheesecake I have yes. the more I eat that's right so for me the things that I really should not eat I really don't want to have them around yeah, because the degree I had them around, the temptation becomes pretty strong to go right. in that direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You say, go you back. I was gonna say, let's chat a little bit about Daniel yes. himself because okay. you you know um, there there is um, there's data on uh, being vegetarian yeah. and only eating vegetables. First off. A lot of vegetarians don't eat the way Daniel did, so we're going to clarify that. Okay. You know, Daniel is not what our modern day vegetarians do. Our modern day vegetarians eat a lot of pasta and bread mm. and rice. Yeah. I don't know how much bread was in his diet, but it sounds like from listening to the word, he only ate vegetables and bread's not a vegetable. The term um, vegetables here means that which is sown and harvested. Oh. So he had to grow out of the ground for Daniel to eat it. Okay. So I, I guess maybe wheat and barley could have been included in that, but I'm thinking more about plant vegetables. Yeah. That it primarily was more right. Yeah. Maybe it included some fruit. Fruit, yes. So fruit, fruit is good. Um, uh, so, so that's the difference. You know, a lot of times we have someone becomes a vegetarian and they don't lose weight or they don't get healthier. It's because they replaced the meats with breads yeah. and maybe even um, pasta and things like that. So, so that's one thing I want to clarify. Secondly, data came out that said people who, eat, uh, who are vegetarians, who eat no meat, tend to live about, I don't know, five, ten years longer than people who actually eat meats. Yeah. But the flaw with that study was this, that they only measured how much vegetables each group ate. Hmm. So what if we did another study and increase the amount of vegetables that the people who eat meat yeah. were eating. Let them eat the meat, fish, chicken, mm -hmm. beef, pork, let them eat those things, but give them more vegetables mm -hmm. and then see if they won't live just as long as the other group does. Mm -hmm. So those are a couple of things I want to cl clarify and then I want to hear the question you had for me. So if I can speak to you a little bit about pasta, we typically think about sort of the flour pasta. Yeah. But now there's all kinds of pastas available, yes. like edamame pasta. Yes. And you get vegetable pasta. You can yes. buy in the store like the shredded sort of uh, cauliflower yes. pasta. Yeah. So you don't have to necessarily think about flour pasta for pasta. Exactly. You can actually get vegetable pasta. That's right. That's yeah. exactly right. And I'm I'm a big fan of all of those. Absolutely, I would do that. Yes, yeah, so you love pasta. There's ways to eat it besides exactly. Pasta. <laughs> exactly. One of the things you mentioned in your presentation, Dr. Amir, is that we have to come to the why. Why do we want to lose weight? Which is probably the big question you think about as yeah. a potential person to lose weight is yeah. like, why do I want to do this? Right. What's going on inside of me? Yeah, and, and everybody has their own different why, but something has to change. Yeah. Almost like a switch that gets flipped hmm. where you become determined 
and you get it done. You know, resolution. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that that that's where the why has to come from. That why may be that you know I'll tell you personally, I exercise on a regular basis and I do my best to eat uh, decent. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I I think the main reason I do that is because I start having children later in life. So when my children are teenagers, I probably is, you know, I, I, I'm considered an older person, you know, you know, most people, my, my friends who are my age, their kids are in college. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I, my kids are two, five and eight in age. <laughs> so, so big difference. I'm probably 10 years behind everybody else. Based on that, I need to stay healthy because I don't want them to miss out on having a younger father for several reasons. So that's, that's my why. So I want to make sure I'm there for them. I want to make sure I'm there when they have children. My, uh, my why would be around my mother, about my age, contracted type 2 diabetes. And it's mainly because of weight gain. Yeah. So to the degree that I can keep the pounds off, I may be able to avoid having that yeah. condition. Absolutely. So if, if that's, and I think for what you were talking about, I have four grandchildren and five fifth ones on the way. Yes. And I'd love to be here for a long time for them. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And determine your why. Make sure it's something compelling and powerful. It may be that um, you're tired of the life that you have now. It may be that you're tired of yo-yo dieting up and down and, and you want to do something that's permanent. It, it may be that there's been some kind of tragic event in your life and and um, that's that's why you want to be healthy whatever it is find something compelling that motivates you and drives you you know there's yeah. been times in our lives where all of us were so focused and driven that maybe we worked through lunch and through dinner and yeah. forgot to go to bed because we were so <laughs> into it once you have that reason yeah and that's non-negotiable don't start any of this unless you have that why of, 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 of what you, you're doing. You mentioned in your presentation a woman who lost 100 pounds. Yes. And uh, she had a sister who was overweight and all kinds of debilitating diabetes and heart disease. And um, they asked her, her why. And she said, because the four kids are left behind, I want to be here for them. That's right. So she got to her why yeah. that motivated her to lose 100 pounds. Yeah, exactly. Her sister passed away. And she had all the same things that her sister had, and she didn't want. Her sister had the four kids, and she didn't want to. The, she had to. She was the guardian. She was the only one left that those kids had. She said, "I don't want to do to my kids what my sister did to them." That's a very compelling story. The second thing you raise is realize that the problem is multifactorial. Yes, it's not. <laughs> it's not just one thing. So if we just change one thing. Yeah. It's not going to get it done. Correct. I, I wish it was so much easier, you know. And you hear these stories, like someone will say, all I did was exercise three minutes in the morning. I changed nothing else. And I am now a professional bodybuilder. <laughs> you know, well, that's an exception, you know, and I'm not saying it's not true. But it, we, we don't want to rely on exceptions. We want to rely on what? works and what makes sense. I would much rather you uh, change a little bit in three different areas of your life yes. than to make a drastic change in one area of your life and not improve the others. So the main, the areas of health and wellness are physical, chemical, and emotional. Yes. So if, if you improve the physical and the chemical, how do you improve physical? Start exercise. Exercise. Yeah. How do you improve the chemical? Eat well. Stop putting bad things in your body, start putting good things in your body. Those two we can easily think of. But let's say you improve those. You eat nothing but vegetables like Daniel and, and, and high quality organic vegetables and you make sure you have good source of protein in there. So so I, I don't, uh, I'm not a vegetarian, but I'm not against being vegetarian as long as you get in the right proteins. You, know, you have to have good plant proteins in your diet. If you're doing that and you're exercising not too much and not too little, just right. But you do nothing about the third dimension, which is the emotional slash psychological dimension. I guarantee you won't get any benefit from the changes. And if you do see a benefit, it's temporary. It's going to go right back to where it was. 
But there is this relationship that I don't completely understand, the neurological relationship between what we think and what we feel mm-hmm. and, and our bodies. Yeah. So I know you're an advocate of sort of a positive mental attitude. 100% versus sort of a negative one. Exactly. So you have to kind of begin to change your mental outlook in order to bring that third one into life. It's true, it's true. But also the mind-body connection. So if you're exercising, but you're watching TV, you're not gonna get benefit from your exercise. As if you were exercising and you were focused on your body and the outcome that you wanna receive. Mm -hmm. So when I'm on, let's say the treadmill running, my thought process is, I'm running so I can learn self-discipline. I'm running so I can gain control of my body. I'm running so I can overcome my uh, tendency towards laziness. And if I do these things, I can set an example for my three sons. And if I do that, then I can be a better dad. And if I do that, then I can be a better son to our Heavenly Father. And and I'm connecting constantly. And if you do this right, and I've been able to achieve it, you will feel more energy at the end of your run than you do at the beginning huh. because you'll get motivated. Huh. Yeah, you, you know, I'm a fan of the movie Rocky. Have you watched it? <laughs> I've seen all five. <clears throat> okay, good. Yeah, and, and they're, they're I, I, I think they're very motivating. I mean, I, I when I watch one of those movies, I actually want to go train. Uh-huh. It makes me want to go train. Well, what if you could do that to yourself? Hmm. And you're on that exercise bike and you're pedaling, but you're flipping through a magazine and reading about the recipes that someone <laughs> used to make a cheesecake. <laughs> your mind's disconnected from your body. There needs to be that connection there. We have to be present. It's almost like if you're having dinner with your spouse and, and it's a nice romantic moment, but your head is somewhere else. You're thinking about the football game last night. You're thinking about the football game going on right now and you want to check the score on your phone and you're not paying attention to your spouse. It's almost like that. So a person who's exercising sometimes doesn't want to be in that moment. They'd rather be doing something else like yeah. eating or, yeah. or watching a show. And what you're saying is that when you disconnect from that, you lose the benefits of uh, absolutely what's happening in that moment of exercise. I I see men and women in my gym who go there every morning. They get there before I get there. They're still there when I leave. Let me say, (laughs) they probably train too long and too hard. But then they get on that exercise machine and and they've done the same thing every day for years. For years, their bodies haven't changed. And every time they're in there, I can see them reading those magazines and not paying attention to what they're doing. All right, so the physical, you said there about exercise, yeah. the chemical introducing to your body, things that are helpful to eat, the psychological, sort of the mental framework. If we do all three, we can add some years to our life. 100%. Yeah. And, and, and really, that, that may be your why, is to live longer. See, uh, there's, a, there's a reason to live longer. Yeah. Do we want to prolong our death, or do we want to prolong our life? Mm. Because at, at first glance, they're the same thing, but they really are not. Someone could live to be 99 years old, but they started dying at 60. Hmm. And someone could live to be 89 years old, but they were vibrant, energetic, and healthy the entire time. Yeah. Who, who lived longer? I would say the one who lived 10 years less actually lived longer. <laughs> Yeah. So, so, you know, I, I hear this a lot where someone will say, I'm not going to give up my cheesecake because, uh, sorry, we're, sounds like we're prejudiced against cheesecake, but that's all that comes to my mind is, is you know, or, or, you know, there was a lady I was speaking to, she, she's ill, she has a tumor growing on her kidney, her liver is failing, she's on 15 different medications, she's literally 200 pounds overweight, she has beautiful grandchildren, and when I said, listen, you really have to give up the croissants that you eat. She, she, she loves eating croissants. I mean, she, she, she eats like 15 croissants every morning. And, <coughs> excuse me, I said, why don't you give up those croissants? You know, why don't we, why don't we do some kind of like, a, like an egg white vegetable omelet or something for you in the mornings? And, and, or, or even, there's nothing wrong with the egg yolk, you know, so eat the whole egg. And there's nothing wrong with that. Have an omelet, have something healthy. And she said, no, this is the only pleasure I have left. I can't get out of my house very much. I can't move, I can't do this, I can't do that. The only pleasure left is for me to eat croissants. And I know for a fact 
that we should get joy from other things than food. Yes. What about her relationship with her grandchildren? Yes. What about the joy they bring in? And what if she could go for a walk with them? What if she could go play with them? What if she could uh, pick them up and hold them? I think there are degrees to pleasure. I think the, the lowest, perhaps, pleasure would be sort of self-indulgence. Mm -hmm. But a sacrificial pleasure of giving something up for the sake of her grandchildren to have better health yeah. would be a greater pleasure. Yeah. So she has to sort of rise in what um, her pleasures mean to her. Yes. Yeah. And maybe that's what Jesus went, meant when, when he talked about those who want to find their life yeah. must yes. lose it. Mm -hmm. And uh, those who want to be first need to be last. And, you know, when you look at these things, the gratification that comes with say, yes. really knowing, hey, I'm doing this for a good reason. Yes. It's not going to be very hard to push the cheesecake away. And, you know, again, I'm not totally against cheesecake. So, so if you once a week, you want to have a really thin slice of cheesecake, do that. But you, you, you don't need a big slice, a small slice. Yeah. And savor it and enjoy it. Because here's the three levels of healthy eating, right? Number one, uh, the healthiest, is to just eat really clean food, really good food, and you know what that is. Second is to eat the unhealthy food and don't feel guilty about it. <laughs> okay. The third least healthy or the most unhealthy is to eat the unhealthy food and feel guilty about it. Mm -hmm. Because what we just talked about, how the mind yeah. connects to the body, mm -hmm. the feeling of guilt is the unhealthiest thing you could ever have. Yeah, That's what turns whatever you put in your body into poison. Wow. That's the reason in France, they're all immune to heart disease, they're all <laughs> immune to obesity, there's hardly any cancer. It's called the French paradox. What's in the French diet? Wine, cheese, cheese bread. bread, every meal. I mean, you know, I lived in Paris for three weeks. I mean, I don't know if you call it living. I, I stayed in Paris for three weeks, and I was staying with locals, and I, I saw what they do, and that's what it is, is, is they, they just really indulge. Yeah. But, you know, we, we take 15 minutes for lunch, 20 minutes for lunch, and during those 20 minutes, we're probably working or on the phone or doing yeah. something. Yeah. They don't. They shut down everything, and they go to lunch. And they take at least an hour, sometimes two. Unlike your patient eating 15 croissants. Yes. So they're having a croissant. Yes. Right? But stretching it out over an hour and enjoying yeah. a conversation. Yes. With their cheese and yeah. Um, yeah. fruit. Yeah, it amazed me. I was, I was looking at a documentary and they said, in France, in kindergarten, they teach the kids how to have meals. Yeah. And here's, here's what we teach in America. We say, stop talking and eat your food. <laughs> and you only have five minutes left, eat faster so you can finish your food. Yeah. In France, they say, sit with a friend. Why are you eating so fast? Talk. Enjoy yourself. Let's talk for a moment, Dr. Amir, about this whole rest and digest versus sort of flying through your food. Like when you eat, the French seem to be demonstrating to us what it means to rest and digest. Sort of like savoring, enjoying the conversation, kind of being in this moment. Yeah. So their body receives it better. Exactly. Because they're able to, re their, their, their mindset is to enjoy. Your entire digestive tract shuts down when you're nervous, or when you're worried, or when you're angry, or when you're upset. Um, I was on the track team in high school. Never ran a race. Uh, <laughs> But I was quote unquote on the track team. <laughs> but we had the really good runners who would prepare for a race. And right before they're walking up to that start line to get in the blocks for that 100 meter dash, they would run out in the bushes and throw up and then come back. And you'll see this before your biggest, greatest moments, you get butterflies in your stomach. Yeah. And if there's something in there, you throw it up. And it's the body preparing itself for that race. You know, and, and um, if, if, if us sitting here right now, all of a sudden through that window, a pack of hungry wolves <laughs> broke and jumped in, we would probably stop digesting food. If we had just had lunch or dinner, we would stop digesting our food. It would just sit there so we could run away. Yeah. There's examples of deer in the woods. If a deer is giving birth, huh. see, the birthing process is supposed to be 
the opposite of fight or flight. It's supposed to be rest and repair. Yeah. So what happens is deer finds a quiet, calm place and starts to relax and goes into labor. And as she's in labor, a lion shows up, let's say. Huh. And she hears the rustling through the bushes and looks, and there's the lion right there. And the minute she sees the lion, believe it or not, her body switches to fight or flight. Huh. When it does, labor ceases. Huh. Delivery stops. She starts running. This happens in nature on a regular basis. She will run as fast as she can to get away from the lion. She's in fight or flight. She'll find another safe place. The minute it's safe, she relaxes. The body goes into rest and repair, rest and digest, wine and dine, they call it. And once she's in there, labor resumes and she'll deliver her kids. And now what happens in the Western world when someone's about to deliver? You, 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 you jump in the car and you speed, yes. right? You're like, whoa, we got to go fast. You know, is, are they in rest and repair at that point? No. They're in fight or flight. And when they get to the hospital, what happens? Grab the wheelchair, put it in, stick the IV, put the machines on, beep, 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 beep. You know, and the doctor runs in and the nurse runs in and go, okay, push. And really, <laughs> it, it, it really Very goes against, against what nature God intended that delivery process, process to be and no, no wonder so many people need um, to be induced and they yeah. need the Pitocin to contract harder and, and they need the epidural because it's too painful and all. Now listen, as men, we have no right to talk about labor and, and, and no way to say, hey, it should be an easy, peaceful process and I know it's, it's still going to be painful, it's still going to be uncomfortable. That's the way the design was. However, we could make it a little better, but make it a little more peaceful uh, for that process. But that's the difference between fight or flight. Same thing, just to answer the question real quick, because I know we're running out of time, is when you're eating, if, if you're in your car, and you're driving, and you got the phone on your shoulder like this, and you're yelling your, at your coworker while you're driving in traffic and someone's cutting you off, and then you're eating something really healthy, your body doesn't know how to process that because your body's in fight or flight. Your body's being chased by that lion. lion, yeah. And all it wants to do was throw up mm -hmm. what you're putting into it, even if it's very healthy. On the other hand, let's say you sit down with a friend, like we are, yeah. and you play some soft classical music, mm -hmm. and, and you, you, you set out your food, and you say a little prayer, yeah. and you get in the mood of, I'm about to receive a blessing from God. Mm -hmm and you start to eat your food and you enjoy every bite, even if there's cheesecake involved, that food, I guarantee, is healthier for you than what you ate in your car driving to work this morning. So our friend Daniel, who made a decision to um, restrict what he was gonna eat, the king's food, and to eat his vegetables and water, that was a physical decision, and he's eating clean food, a chemical decision, but probably also a psychological one, he felt no guilt. Yes. He could receive these vegetables and water. Yes. And it was healthier yes. than the other ten. Absolutely right. Well, there's more to be said about this subject. We should continue <laughs> this. Let's do it again. We'll be back. Okay. <laughs> back for part two. Part two. Wow, that was amazing.